everyone. We are here for a career Q&A. I have not done one of these in a while, so I'm excited to answer as many questions as I possibly can in about the next 30 minutes or so. So as people are joining, start to put your questions in the chat and I will start to answer them in about two minutes. So I'm just going to give some time for people to join, make a few quick announcements, and then we will go from there. And I'm just going to check on my other monitor to make sure that people are able to see us in all the right places. In theory, this should be streaming to YouTube and LinkedIn all at once. Looks like it is. Wonderful. All right. I am <laughs> going to pull up the comments over here so I can see them all in one place. And then we will get started. I see some questions coming in already. So I do have one quick announcement for you. All right. The announcement is, in case you didn't know, um, tomorrow I am doing a new workshop called Product Strategy for Your Career. Um, I'm really excited about this. Every time I show my team new slides for this workshop, they are so excited and freak out because um, the things we're going to teach uh, are going to be really, really helpful in helping you think of your career and you as a product. Kind of ironic. So that's what we'll be doing tomorrow. And tomorrow we will also be launching the details of what we're calling Career Strategy Lab 2.0. Career Strategy Lab is the career coaching incubator that I run, which is really designed to help you design a career that allows you to live your dream life, whatever that looks like. So that's what we'll be doing tomorrow. After that workshop, I really hope that you kind of leave with a strategic plan for how to reach your short and long-term career goals, whether that might mean growing your confidence, um, building more strategic relationships, maybe having more clarity about what skills you need to focus on developing in the short and long term, or maybe even, of course, landing a new job if that is something that is on your radar right now. But how do you join this workshop tomorrow? I'm going to put it in the chat here. So give me a second to do that. Um, you have to RSVP though. So... I'm putting it there and I will put it in the other, in the YouTube comments as well, which goes over here. All right. And there we go. So you have to RSVP. Otherwise you can't come. Um, all right. So that is what we are going to be doing tomorrow. And let's get to the questions here. All right. So I'm going to kind of try and curate some of them here. So let's start um, at the beginning. Angela. Angela wants to know, what is the difference between UX designer and product designer? And I think if we asked multiple different people, we very well could get multiple different answers. Angela, I think you're probably asking this because you see job titles um, change from company to company, right? Some job titles might say UX designer, product designer, UX, UI designer, et cetera. Um, I think the job title and role product designer, um, we're seeing that a little bit more frequently, it seems like, because I think there can be this assumption, and notice I'm saying can, right? There can be this assumption that UX people, 
may be more designer like, let's say, versus the product designer might be more well versed in things beyond design, whether that might be product management, product strategy, more experience with um, business type things like business analysis or collaborating with other departments. And yes, I'm somewhat speaking in generalizations, but I think the product designer job title, and when I actually read the job descriptions, the vibe I'm getting is that they're looking for someone who can't just move stuff around on the screen and work in Figma or whatever software is popular this week, but they can hop into meetings with stakeholders from other departments, be given a bunch of research or business data, and they could hit the ground running. They wouldn't be intimidated and not be able to you know, look through data or analytics and stuff and be intimidated. So Angela, I'm curious if that answers your question or at least helps you start to think about those differences a little more clearly. Like I said, I think that we ask multiple people, we're going to get multiple different answers. But that is my kind of quick take on that question. So let me know what you think. I'm just going to see... There's no really easy way for me to see your replies here. (laughs) Maybe if you can go back to your original question, that would be a good way to do it. So let me know. Um, Anyone else have insights on that? Feel free to drop it in the chat or (laughs) respond to Angela's kind of original question. Um, Let's move on to some other ones here. Let's see. Um, Umar wants to know, should UX designers have a say in the overall product strategy and decision-making process, or should they strictly focus on the user experience aspect? You know, I think that really depends from company to company, right? In a small company where it's a UX team of one or a startup with, you know, a handful of people who are involved in the product development, The UX designer might have more influence and say in the product strategy, but in a large company like an Amazon or a Delta Airlines or some, you know, Home Depot, there may be less opportunity for that specific person in a more design centric role to have influence over that product strategy because there's, you know, people above them that are doing that. So I don't think that we can really say it's true. The same thing is true at all companies because there's so much context that would be involved there. Um, I do think that UX designers should always be operating from a place of strategy. And if you're ever asked to be doing things um, and you don't understand the strategy and you're being asked to do things almost in a prescriptive way, I think it can be very useful for your own kind of knowledge gathering, but also um, for you to create an opportunity to be educated by your boss, your manager, other stakeholders about that strategy, right? So in your case, Umar, if you're being asked to do stuff, maybe say, okay, like, I'm happy to explore that solution, but can you let me know, like, what's the bigger picture here? What strategy is this related to, et cetera? So that might be one thing to think about there. Um, Let's see. Rocio wants to know, you're wrapping up a UX internship and then looking at UX consultant positions. Any tips or recommendations on UX consultant positions? So I don't know if you mean <clears throat> you would be working at like a UX consulting agency or if you want to be like a freelance consultant. Um, 
one of the, well, first of all, I think you're wrapping up this internship. So I think there are a lot of benefits in going into UX consulting, whether that means you're going to go work at like a UX agency or you are going to take on your own clients because when you are earlier in your career, it can be very strategic to try and expose yourself to many different types of products and many different types of industries. So in doing this, you are going to be able to test the waters and maybe one project you're working on is in healthcare. And two months from now, you're working on a finance project. And in December, you're working on something in travel, for example. Those are all really awesome opportunities to find out if you maybe gravitate towards certain industries or certain types of products. Like maybe you realize after consulting for 12 months, you are really drawn to enterprise products versus consumer products or vice versa. So hopefully that answers your question. And I guess to follow up, if you are thinking of going the consulting route where, you know, you would be operating as a, an entity and you are freelancing, um, I think the, the most important thing you need to do is make sure you have a solid contract. And we don't have time to go into the details of creating contracts and proposals and things like that, but very, very, very important Otherwise, um, that relationship can get very confusing um, very quickly and people can be taken advantage of and that's no fun. So make sure you, and you want to make sure you get paid too, right? So those are my super quick tips on that. Um, let's see what else we have. Okay. We answered Nikki. Let's see. And you guys vote on each other's questions, like give the questions a thumbs up or something so I can kind of prioritize the ones that seem to be applicable to lots of different people here. Um, let's see. So I want to see. Um, oh, Jessica wants to know, can you elaborate on some non-techs, non-tech, um, UX jobs, like basically UX jobs in other industries, I think is what you are asking. And in the chat, um, I wrote an article about this. So let me grab the link to the article so you can read that because it'll go into far more detail than I can go into in just a few minutes here. So I will post this. I will reply to Jessica's um, comment second. Great. I did that. But how do you find UX product tech jobs outside of the tech industry? So I know many of you have seen the layoffs for the past year, right? Um, and I think it's very easy for us to say, well, UX product tech people are ba being laid off. Therefore, no industry is hiring. And that is false. Um, you'll see it in the article. But there are many other industries where people with our skill sets are needed, right? Banks, energy companies, travel, like with, um, with travel resuming and now it sounds like surpassing uh, pre-COVID numbers, um, airlines, hotels, other travel-related companies, right? Healthcare companies, health insurance companies. Um, so think about those types of industries for sure. Government would be another one. Um, and also think about possibly like local companies, right? A, a couple of times in the past... I don't know, a few months, I've had people in one of my career coaching programs um, get hired at local utility companies or local energy companies. And they would never have thought to apply for a job there, but their takeaway and feedback after they got hired was it actually pays them more 
and creates a better work-life balance than they would have had, or for some of them who are already working in the industry, like previously had at big household name type companies. So in that article, I also linked to a few job boards. One of them specifically is built in B-U-I-L-T dot I-N. They have a great job board that allows you to search and filter by industry. So um, that might be something to consider as well. Hopefully that answers your question, Jessica. Um, let's see. You're welcome. All right. We are going to go back like this. All right. I'm trying to see all the questions with the thumbs up here. Um, okay. Let's see. I'm going to go back up. Make sure we didn't miss any of them. They have a bunch of thumbs ups. All right. Esteban wants to know, do I think that UX strategy is something that is marketable today? I assume you mean like in terms of skills that you have and trying to market those skills to potential employers, whether that's your short-term job search or your long-term career goals. But yeah, I think UX strategy is super, super important. I think it can be quite a differentiator for people especially kind of goes back to our question at the beginning, right? Around UX designer versus product designer. I think those product design type roles, kind of a subtext of those job descriptions is they're looking for people with more strategy. Now, strategy is a big word that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, similar to product designer. But I think the, the heart of it is really that you are thinking beyond a screen that you're moving elements and components around on that screen and rearranging them and user flows and things. And you're thinking not just, for example, not just about the product you are building or the app that you are building, but you're also thinking about like, okay, well, how might these changes in the product impact, impact sales or what could we do with the marketing team to get more people aware of this app? Um, what could we do to like the logged out version of the homepage, for example, to maybe be more effective from a marketing perspective to then get people to sign up to do a free trial to maybe eventually become a customer? So it's not just about like the design and everything related to perfect pixels. It's about understanding how that design designed product fits in and plays with the marketing, the sales, the acquisition, et cetera. So yeah, I think strategy super, super important. And I think to be good at strategy requires that you have experience with and awareness of those other kind of departments and areas in a business. Um, we could talk about strategy for so much longer, but hopefully that gives you kind of a very high level, high level answer. And I think too, strategy is something that a lot of candidates lack today, especially candidates that are earlier in their career or transitioning into UX, you know, from another industry because there can be such a hyper focus in the world of UX education on just like memorizing processes and using software and following this proverbial like perfect UX process or double diamond process or whatever you want to call it. Um, and not enough people are being taught this business and strategy side of things. So if you have strategy skills and experience, that potentially is a muscle that you should really try and flex and go back to your career materials. And when I say career materials, I mean your resume, LinkedIn profile, about me, elevator pitch, portfolio, et cetera, and find out if there are opportunities in there where you might be able to kind of up play, if that's a word, um, your experience with strategy. Um, 
So hopefully that answers your question, Esteban. I'm going to give it a thumbs up so I know I answered it. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Um, oh, we answered Jessica's. All right. Um, all right. I'm just reading a few here. Um, lots of questions about strategy. Yeah, I think we've covered a lot of those questions. So if you asked a strategy question and I haven't answered something about it, maybe rephrase your question for me. Um, let's see. Okay. Barbara wants to know, do I have any tips um, for people who are changing careers into user experience um, regarding their portfolio? So portfolio tips for career switchers. And yes, that is something that I wrote down before this as a topic I wanted to get to. Um, because one of the kind of concerns that I hear from a lot of career switchers is that I didn't previously have a job title of UX designer, product designer. UX researcher, for example. Therefore, can I include, for example, research I've done in my previous career, even though I've never had the job title of UX researcher? My stance is yes. And let's continue with this research example. So let's say I, I had a teacher once who was uh, in one of my career coaching programs. And they were transitioning into user experience from a career in teaching. One of the projects they did while they were a teacher was that they developed some curriculum. And as a part of that curriculum development, they did research. And they were concerned that they couldn't use that research as a project to highlight their research skills. And my challenge to them was, why not? Like research is research. Of course, there are things that might be different, right? But um, using that research project they did while developing their curriculum helped showcase the transferable skills that they had as a teacher. So um, for you, Barbara, I would think to yourself, from whatever career you are switching from, and then thinking about what do you want to do as or in the umbrella of user experience, think about are there projects you've worked on that you could use to shine a spotlight on these skills that would really translate from whatever you previously did to what you want to do in the future. And that applies to everyone. Um, I see some questions regarding what to do if you're trying to switch from academia into user experience, same thing, right? The, the thing that I see often with people switching from academia, because a lot of UX researchers or like PhD level researchers seem to be wanting to explore switching into the world of UX research, which I think is great. Now, the thing you need to be very mindful of is that when you take research projects you did like for your training or PhD level education, um, how can you make sure that it is being presented through, it's being presented, you know, while remembering kind of the user of your portfolio, right? Because one mistake I see people like you make is that sometimes your research is so academic and so in the weeds that it's really hard to follow. So you almost need to like dumb it down a little bit and pretend that you're no longer talking to your peers because you're not and figure out how would I describe what I did kind of in layman's terms or to someone with like a sixth grade level reading comprehension. Um, because oftentimes the research that you previously did was really written and conducted like in a way that would ultimately be consumed for your peers. 
So that's just one little tip I have because I see it happen over and over. And you just have to figure out how do you communicate what you did in a way that's not going to confuse people because the minute people are confused, they're lost. And you don't want to lose people because you really do have a lot of awesome experience that could translate well into UX research. You just need to make sure you are not presenting it in a way that's super complicated or hard to understand. All right. Um, let's see what else we have. Okay. Barbara, that was Barbara's question. Now I've lost Barbara's comment, but, um, somewhere it's there. Okay. We answered that one. Let's see here. Um, okay. Let's see what else. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Barbara said that answered her question. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to see what other questions there are. Okay. Oh, I like this one. Okay. Sarah says, is it a bad idea to try and market yourself as a UX researcher and a UX designer? I've been told yes and no. As the market is so bad, I've been trying to market myself as a jack of all trades. Is this a good idea? What are my thoughts? So Sarah, um, we share the same name and we share the same skill set. So I call myself a UX researcher and experience designer. Um, I've been saying that, I don't know, for like at least the past 12 years or so, um, because I do both of those things. And I didn't just want to box myself into one or the other. So um, on, you know, versions of my resume, in versions of what is on my LinkedIn headline, the, the text below my name on LinkedIn, I say I'm a UX researcher and experience designer. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Many of us are kind of hybrid in our skill sets and there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think it's going to come across as you being a jack of all trades type thing. Um, I think that maybe radar can creep up like yellow flags if people's, if people's kind of LinkedIn headlines or resumes say, I'm a UX researcher and designer and information architect and UX writer, and I'm an expert in AI. And I'm also a founder and I'm also good at developing. And I also, you know, do all these things like that starts to look a little suspicious. And I start to wonder what are your true strengths? Like, are you truly, truly great at all of those things? Um, so be careful of that. But Sarah, I do think there's nothing wrong with saying you're a UX researcher and a designer. Totally acceptable. Um, the one thing you'd be want you'd want to be mindful of is on your resume and on your LinkedIn and in your if you have a portfolio presentation, you want to make sure that you're like showing the receipts of that, right? That your resume shows receipts that demonstrate research experience and receipts that demonstrate design experience. Because if you say you do those things, but you don't have the receipts, how are people going to believe that, right? So let me know if that answers your question. I see a bunch of thumbs up for that one. You know, it's, it's kind of just like common sense too, right? If you say you're good at those two things, that's reasonable. If you say you're good at like 15 different job titles. Mm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to believe that. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. Going back up to the top. Um, let's see. Michael says, Michael on YouTube says, I'm an educator who has been trying to transition into UX research since spring of 2022 Given layoffs and overall cut in UXR positions, should I wait till Q4 2024, oh, Q4 of 2023, or wait until January 2024 before jumping back into applying? So, um, Michael, 
I think that, and we answered this a little earlier, but maybe broaden the companies and industries you're applying to. I don't know where you're applying right now, but based on what I said earlier about like, just because you're seeing all the big um, household name co type companies do layoffs doesn't mean companies you've never heard of aren't hiring. Does that mean you're going to have to put a little bit of more effort into maybe finding these companies that you've never heard of? Yes, but I don't think that it's necessary to completely pause your job search right now because you're kind of making a generalization that there's no jobs. Um, so that's going to like reframe number one. Reframe number two for you is you're switching into user experience from a previous career in education. Something really strategic you could do would be to think to yourself and go find companies that are in the education industry or have education-related products and experiment with applying to them. And the strategy of that is that if you, Michael, with let's say 10 years of education experience, apply to a UX researcher job at a company in the education space, and someone else applies who has zero user experience in the education space, guess which candidate might stand out more, right? You. Because you are not going to need to spend time getting ramped up on education-related knowledge that might be beneficial to the job. So, you know, be strategic about that. Think about the Udemy's, the Coursera's, the Khan Academies, even companies like masterclass.com, um, software that powers online learning, such as Teachable or Kajabi or maven.com. Those could be really strategic companies to keep in mind. And um, I really don't think you should hit pause on your job search, though. I think it just means you need to be more strategic about where you are applying. Um, all right, Michael, hopefully that answers your question. Um, let's see what else we have here. I just want to check one little thing. Make sure we're getting our questions off YouTube. Looks like we are. Okay. Um, oh, the questions disappeared. All right. Um, let's see. We answered that one. Jessica wants to know if someone is transitioning into, you know, the world of UX from a design related field like architecture, are junior roles the best fit? Um, I really think it depends. And I know it's frustrating when I give answers that start with it depends, but it truly does. I think that um, the thing to remember with job descriptions is that they are a wish list. And think of the criteria on job descriptions like guardrails. Like it is not a set of requirements and you must check every box in order to apply for a job. Um, I see a lot of people make assumptions that if the job description says you must have three years of experience and you have one or two, they won't apply. And I think there can still be value in applying if you have strong skills and previous experience, such as you might have from your days in architecture. So I wouldn't let the job description kind of serve as this checklist, which it sounds like maybe you might be doing. Um, but I don't think you necessarily need to be starting from, you know, ground zero in terms of level, but it also just, it depends on the size of the company, right? Larger companies have more strict rules um, around kind of the like designer one, designer two, designer three, for example, and what each of those means. And that's attached to pay grade. So there might be less kind of wiggle room there, but for smaller companies, um, it might be different. And the other thing, like I said, with Michael um, coming from teaching, you might want to focus on um, 
UX jobs uh, that might be in the architecture space or construction space. There's so many interesting um, companies working on software related to those two industries. You know, I even think of like Havenly.com, um, those kind of virtual design my do the interior design of my room type products. Maybe there's opportunities there. So get creative, Jessica, about where you're looking for jobs because that might that architecture experience might give you an edge if you're applying to jobs in the architecture, construction, building, design, interior design type spaces. Um, okay, I cannot believe we've already been at this for 40 minutes. So let me see if there's one more popular one that might be worth answering here. And then um, I got to get going because I have a full day ahead of me. Um, let me see here. Okay, we answered those. We answered those. I want to make sure I'm paying attention to the YouTube people. Let me see. Okay, we answered that one. Mm, you're welcome, Michael. Um, okay, this one from YouTube. All right, as a career changer, what would be the most important aspect that the employer will see on my portfolio? You're currently taking a boot camp and worried your portfolio is not as good as other candidates. So you're a career changer, similar to what I said to other people. If you have things you've worked on in your previous career that after listening to the Q&A today, you've realized, oh, wow, that research project I did as a teacher, I could use that as a research project in my portfolio. That would be great. I think if you have opportunities to take real world projects you've worked on, in addition to potentially projects that you work on during your boot camp, that can be great. The reason is a lot of projects that come out of boot camps look the same. And it's not your fault. This is how the boot camps teach you to present them. Um, and the problem with that is that recruiters and hiring managers can spot those very easily because they all, not all of them, many, many, many of them, follow this cookie cutter approach, right? Design, develop, diverge, converge, et cetera. Um, they all just sound the same. And it makes people question kind of your understanding of what you learned, right? Are you just like Mad Lib style creating a portfolio? Or do you have deeper insights? How well have you grasped what you learned? So real world projects are very important because they also allow you to talk about like what didn't work in the project. What problems did you encounter? This is another one of the challenges with projects that come out of boot camps is that they're done in a vacuum, in a silo where there are no stakeholders emailing you at one in the morning saying like, we're going to change this, this, and this, and that's what we're going to do. Or we're pulling the budget on this and now you have two weeks to complete it versus two months. So four things you've worked on in the past, highlight what didn't work well, what didn't go well, because there's no shame in talking about the reality of a project because that's the real world. And that can also help you stand out. I've spoken to enough recruiters and hiring managers to know that when they see these, you know, perfect style projects presented, um, it leaves them wondering, yeah, that's nice, but tell me about the time that you had to do it in half the time or with half the budget or half the requirements got changed at the ninth hour. Um, so hopefully that gives you some ideas. Um, let's see what other comments do we have here? Um, yes. Highlight your process, the steps you went through, your solution. Don't just focus on deliverables, right? It's not like next time I made a survey, then I did some research. It's not just what you did. We have to also say 
why did you do that research method? How did you find those people? Why did you decide you wanted to talk to those specific people in, in research versus these other people? And what did you learn as a result of that research? So it's not just about the what you did. It's not just about the deliverable. It's about how you did it, why you did it, what happened, what, how did what you did inform the next step in the process? Did it make you realize you had to go back three steps and repeat the research or research a different topic, right? So exactly. Um, all right. I truly have to go now. This was fun. I haven't done one of these Q&As in a while, so I'm planning to do more of them in the future. So the best way to find out about these Q&As is to make sure that you follow me on LinkedIn or YouTube and make sure that on my profile, you click that bell button, um, bell icon that will alert you kind of in real time when I go live um, to make sure you don't miss another one. All right. And don't forget tomorrow, um, at four o'clock Eastern, I will be doing, um, my new workshop product strategy for your career. I saw a lot of questions today about strategy. Tomorrow is all about strategy. So I'm going to drop the link in the chat again, in case you all want to join me. RSVP for the Oops. I think I spelled that right. All right, there it is. I'll put that on YouTube also. And um, I think that's all for a day. Also, if you have friends, colleagues, whomever that you think would be interested in this Q&A, um, send them the link or just mention them in a comment and then they'll be right like, on this event and they can hear all the answers to your awesome questions today. Um, all right, everyone, thank you for hanging out. I see a bunch of you RSVP'd for tomorrow. So we're gonna go through and send out um, the official invites later this afternoon. And I think that is all, oh, the link. Jennifer, I will put it right there for you. I'm going to leave this open for about another minute just in case there's any kind of last questions regarding tomorrow. I'm not answering any more real-time questions, but you guys can't see the link. I'm putting it on, I'm putting it in the LinkedIn chat right now. So I'll say it out loud. If you just go to career strategy lab dot com slash party p-a-r-t-y that's like um a short link that we created so you can either click on the one i put in the chat in the comments i should say or career strategy lab dot com slash party it's so really weird jennifer i'm gonna reply to you well i replied do you see it Give it a thumbs up or something. This is very bizarre. Um, I'm going to go back through the comments and comment to your, um, to anyone who said they couldn't find the link. I'm kind of baffled why you're not seeing it, but um, I will, I will add it in individual comments after I end this live stream. All right. I don't know what's up with that, but strange UX issue. So I will see many of you tomorrow and hopefully more of you at future Q and A's. So have a great rest of your Wednesday, everyone. And I will talk to you later. Bye. See ya.